Dr. Uh, Shabir Ali, you go right ahead. In this final uh, hour of debate, uh, folks, I'd like to again uh, summarize and deal with the topic at hand. Uh, in summarizing, we should recognize that uh, in what has transpired over the last couple of days, uh, to me, very little remains uh, of, of the footing of Christianity. Look what has come up. We have so shown that there are writings in the New Testament uh, which are forged in other people's names uh, in order to, to advance, for example, Paul. Second Peter is forged in Peter's uh, name. Uh, we, we have seen that uh, the idea of the crucifixion of Jesus is actually developed throughout the gospel so that uh, the later the gospel, the more sure you can be that Jesus died and the more sure you can be that Jesus actually appeared to his disciples back from the dead uh, uh, on a number of occasions. So the occasions are multiplied, the clarity of the view uh, and the experience with this risen Jesus and all of that increases as we go from earlier to later Gospels. No, it is not just the Muslim who is saying this. This is what Christian scholars are, are saying, including D.G. Dunn. And uh, we have seen, uh, finally, that uh, Paul was in... Uh, a, a deep rift with the original disciples of Jesus. There was a separation between Peter and Paul and a book which actually deals with this uh, most uh, 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 focused, uh, in a most focused manner, is this book entitled St. Paul versus St. Peter, A Tale of Two Missions by Michael uh, Goulder. So uh, the scholars one after another show that uh, Christianity has become Pauline. Now, does that mean that uh, Muhammad did not give the truth about Jesus? Uh, and, uh, what, what it does actually mean is that uh, the uh, truth about Jesus was hijacked by Paul and the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace actually brought uh, uh, the teachings of Jesus reinstated now in the Quran one final time. So when we come to the Quran then we have a clarity about Jesus. We know who exactly he was. He was a prophet and servant of God and that confirms what the Bible teaches. The Quran insists that there is only one God and that's what Jesus was teaching. We saw yesterday that in Mark when a man asked teach, uh, Jesus what is the greatest his commandment, Jesus said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So he emphasized monotheism. Jesus fell on his face and prayed to that one God. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not likely that Jesus uh, told people that he was going to die for the sins of the world. That's a very problematic belief. So it says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, that Jesus said that he came to give his life as a ransom for many. That's Pauline teaching, and it shows Mark's influence from Paul. Uh, uh, what's wrong with that? Well, uh, if you say that Jesus died as a ransom for the sinners, that means that the sinners were somehow like in the devil's uh, uh, captivity, and Jesus is paid to the devil. Does God give his son to the devil in order to rescue the sinners? So the devil is now on equal bargaining terms with God? It doesn't make any sense. What makes sense is what we know from the New Testament, that Jesus, on whom be, be peace, taught that God forgives you without requiring the price to be paid. Luke chapter 15 is filled with stories uh, all depicting the same thing. For example, the story of the prodigal son. The son went away and came back to the father and the father welcomed him with open arms. Even though he had disobeyed and he had spent his inheritance, but the father welcomed him because that was his son and the father celebrated his return. Nobody had to die, nobody had to pay the penalty. It makes no sense to say that we're going to penalize somebody because we want to forgive somebody else. Uh, what makes sense is that God freely forgives the repentant sinner when the sinner turns back to God. And that is the Quranic teaching. So the teachings have been brought back uh, to where it was. Now, uh, if, uh, what about Jesus and whom be peace saying that one will come after him? Uh, do we have any evidence that that could have been the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace? Now, uh, the influence from the uh, Pauline teachings uh, were such that uh, it was thought that God was sending prophets over time and finally God sent his son, Jesus, and therefore no more other prophets seem to be necessary. The whole drama of uh, salvation has played out in history. It has come to an end. But once we realize that Jesus was a prophet, then we realize that there is no end to the, to the uh, series of prophets. Muslims believe that Muhammad on whom be peace is the final prophet by explicit declaration in the Muslim sources. So Muslims are saying we, don't, we didn't invent the idea that Muhammad is uh, the last prophet. That's what our sources say. Now the Christian Bible, if we take it that Jesus is the son of God and it looks like there's no need for prophets. But once we realize that he was a prophet of God, then uh, who was the last prophet? Where does it say he was the last prophet? There isn't. 
anything in the Bible indicating that. On the contrary, there are things indicating that Jesus uh, expected other prophets to come after him and he's teaching Christians how to differentiate between the true prophet and the false prophet. Now, in John chapter 14, 15 and 16, there are sayings of Jesus which, in which he predicts the coming of the paraclete. In John chapter 14, verse 26, it says clearly the paraclete, the Holy Spirit. So Christians cite that and say, Muslims, you don't know what, it's talking, what you're talking about. Jesus clearly spoke about the Holy Spirit. It's not your prophet Muhammad. Okay, but let's uh, look at Christian history and how this has actually been discussed by Christian scholars. Hans Windisch, for example, in his book on the topic, says that what Jesus originally predicted was a human being, another human being, a prophet like Jesus. How then did it come to be the Holy Spirit in, in John chapter 14, verse 26? In fact, C.K. Barrett, uh, in his commentary on John's Gospel, shows that some early manuscripts did not have a holy in this place, and it just simply said spirit. So if we're talking about the spirit of truth, that's possible, uh, possibly a, a depiction of a human being who is so much the embodiment of truth that he's referred to as the spirit of truth. Other indications show that, in fact, uh, what Jesus was speaking about was not the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit was, always, uh, uh, was al already always there. Uh, but uh, he, Jesus was talking about someone who was not there yet and who would come later on. It is true that some of the sayings are stylized to make it mean that it is the Holy Spirit, like the, he is going to be in you and so on. But that means that the saying of Jesus has been transmitted over the decades until it came uh, to be represented in John's Gospel in five different versions within these three chapters. And when we comb these versions back to reconstruct what was the original, scholars like Hans, Hans Windisch and others are saying that the original was such that Jesus was speaking about another human being to come after him until in some of the versions it now looks like he was talking about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, it is even more clear that Jesus was talking about uh, a, a human being to come after him, another prophet, especially the last of the two sayings in John chapter 16. So Muslims in identifying the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as the paraclete are not doing so because the Quran requires them to do so, uh, but they're doing so because it is very clear Clear. The Quran says that Jesus spoke about one to come after him who will be Ahmed and uh, Muslims are saying it looks like this is one place where Christians need to pay attention because Jesus must have said it in a more clear way uh, but some surviving element of what Jesus spoke about seems to be here and that indicates the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace. Do we have any other reason for thinking that the Quran, the message revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is an authoritative book from God? Yesterday I began to mention some of this but I'll mention some more now. Uh, Abdul Daim Al Kahil uh, has set up a website in which he discusses this in, in detail and he's presented a 274 PDF uh, page document, uh, 274 page PDF document that you can download for free. It is filled with examples of things uh, turning out in the Quran to be multiples of, of seven. Now, there's so many that you can hardly credit this to coincidence. We know that uh, if you pick a number at random, for it to be a multiple of seven, it's, the chances are one out of seven. And two numbers, and, and for both of them to be multiple of seven, the chances are one out of 49. We are seeing multiple and multiple. Yesterday I mentioned uh, a, a passage of the Quran that mentions the number seven, that's uh, the verse 196 of Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, that uh, 196 turns out to be seven times seven times four. So it's uh, seven twice. So the chances of that is one out of 49. Uh, moreover, uh, seven times four is 28. So we can say this is seven times 28. And what's 28? Uh, mathematicians have the concept of what is called a, a, a perfect number. Uh, only 48 such numbers are known to mathematicians so far. 28 is one of them. Uh, so 28 has the unique uh, distinction that it is what mathematicians call a, call a perfect number, and it also is a multiple of 7. And uh, this verse, 196, which mentions the number 7, turns out to be a multiple of 7 and 28. It's a very unique number. The chance of getting that particular verse number where the 7 is mentioned is 1 out of 196. It's a very remote chance. But more than this, if we look at the first place where the Quran mentions the number 7 and the last place where the Quran mentions the number 7, we see One that minute. the first mention is in the second chapter in the 29th verse, which means how many verses came before it? 28, our perfect number again. The last mention is in the 78th chapter in the, uh, in the, 20, uh, in the 12th verse. Uh, and that uh, chapter has 40 verses. So how many verses come after the last mention? Also 28, again, our perfect number. How many verses elapse between the first mention and the last mention inclusive? A number of times uh, divisible by 7 coming out flush with no remainder. 
Now, how does all of this play out in a document like this? Is this mere chance? When we know how the Quran came to be revealed and, and documented, collected, and recited over time and transmitted in writing, we see that nobody actually planned it to come out like this except the invisible hand of God that worked on it to make sure that these coincidences uh, arise, arise like this. And this is not mere coincidence, this is proof that there is the, the, the Quran is an inspiration from the Almighty God. Thank you, Shabir. Uh, we're going to go reset the clock for 10 minutes to give David uh, his opportunity to speak on Does Muhammad Give Us the Truth About Jesus? David, your 10-minute uh, time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Shabir, for laying out your reasons for trusting what Muhammad says about Jesus. I'll share my reasons for not trusting what Muhammad says about Jesus, and viewers can compare our cases. Uh, there are two basic ways for someone like Muhammad to show that he's a reliable source of information about someone like Jesus who came centuries before him. The first would be to show that he's an intellectually reliable source of information. For instance, uh, Muhammad could, if Muhammad could demonstrate his ability to sift through uh, ancient sources and historical data to arrive at accurate conclusions, we might trust him on that basis. The second way would be for Muhammad to show that he's a spiritually reliable source of information about Jesus. If we had good reasons to think that Muhammad speaks for God, we would have reasons to uh, believe what he says about Jesus. And this is the, the uh, approach Shabir took um, towards the end of his presentation. So let's see if Muhammad's reliability can be confirmed in either of these two ways. Now, Muhammad clearly wasn't a scholar or a historian. There are questions as to whether he was literate. literate. So he couldn't have done much historical research. Uh, he was born more than half a millennium after Jesus in a different country. So oral tradition, uh, reliable oral, oral tradition would have been out of the question. Uh, he didn't speak any of the relevant languages for examining the teachings of Jesus. Uh, seventh century Arabia was an oral culture, so most stories would be passed around by word of mouth. So the question here would be whether Muhammad could tell the difference between fact and fiction, and he simply couldn't. In Surah 18, Allah tells us that Alexander the Great traveled so far west, well, Dual Karnain, if you interpret that as Alexander the Great, uh, that he traveled so far west, he found the place where the sun sets. Now, not only can I guarantee you that Alexander the Great never found the place where the sun sets, we know that this was a popular story during Muhammad's lifetime. The story was even circulating in a Syriac work called The Glorious Deeds of Alexander towards the end of Muhammad's life. Earlier in Surah 18, we read about the companions of the cave, a group of people who supposedly uh, went to sleep and then woke up 300 years later. This myth goes back to Bishop uh, Stephen of Ephesus, and it's around the middle of the fifth century. According to Surah 19, Jesus began preaching as soon as he came out of Mary's womb. The story comes from the 6th century Arabic infancy gospel. The story of a bird teaching Cain how to bury his brother in Surah 5 comes from Mishnah Sanhedrin. The legend of Mary giving birth under a palm tree in Surah 19 comes from an apocryphal work called The History of the Nativity of Mary and the Savior's Infancy, uh, written in the early 600s, so this is Muhammad's lifetime. The account of Jesus giving life to clay birds in Surah 5 comes from a second century work called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. It, it looks like Muhammad simply took every story that was popular during his life and gave it an Islamic twist and then included it in the Quran. What's interesting is that even the pagans, even the polytheists of Mecca were better at recognizing fiction than Muhammad was. We read in Surah 6 verse 25, when they come to you to argue with you, the unbelievers say, these are nothing but fables of the men of old. So these are the pagans saying, Muhammad, you don't, you don't really believe these stories, do you? So there's no way we can accept Muhammad as an intellectually reliable source of information uh, about Jesus, but can we accept him as a spiritually reliable source? Well, Muhammad couldn't perform miracles. According to the Quran, his only miracle was the Quran itself. The Quran, you'll, call, you'll recall, is the book filled with second through uh, early seventh century fables, not quite what most people would consider miraculous. But the problem isn't just that Muhammad couldn't perform miracles, is that there are all kinds of spiritual warning signs in Muhammad's life. We know from early Muslim records that when Muhammad began receiving revelations, his first impression was that he was possessed by some sort of poetry, spirit or demon or jinn. Uh, in fact, he was so disturbed by this experience that he tried to hurl himself off a cliff. 
A few years later, he delivered what are now called the, the satanic verses. So, so when he was delivering these verses to his followers, uh, he initially revealed verses saying that Muslims could pray to three goddesses, Alat, Alusa, and Manat, and that these three goddesses, we called them cranes, exalted cranes, they would carry your prayers to Allah. But a little later, Muhammad told his followers that these verses, which he had delivered as part of Surah 53, uh, weren't from God, they were from Satan. Uh, so, and, and, so Muhammad blamed Satan for tricking him into revealing these verses. So according to Muslim sources, at least on this occasion, Muhammad couldn't tell the difference between something coming from, from God through the angel Gabriel and something coming from Satan. It's also interesting to note that at one point late in life, Muhammad claimed to be the victim of a magic spell that gave him delusional thoughts and false beliefs. This is from multiple passages in Bukhari where someone got Muhammad's hairbrush and used it to cast a spell on him. Now, these spiritual kinds of issues, which call into question his spiritual reliability, uh, are compounded by certain revelations in the Quran, which I don't see any, uh, any purpose other than, uh, than satisfying certain desires that Muhammad would have. For instance, uh, Surah 4.3 of the Quran says that Muslims can have up to four wives. But we know from Bukhari that Muhammad had at least nine, if not 11 wives at the same time. So, if the Quran limits Muslim men to four wives, why does Muhammad get more? And the only answer is that in chapter 33, verse 50, Allah gives Muhammad a special moral privilege to have more than the four wife allotment. Muhammad had an adopted son named Zayd. It was called Zayd ibn Thabit. Zayd, I mean Zayd uh, ibn Muhammad, sorry, different Zayd. Uh, so uh, Muhammad has an adopted son, great practice. But Zayd has a wife, Muhammad, one day, after seeing her rise up, said she uh, rose up in haste and excited the admiration of Muhammad. Uh, Zayd finds out that Muhammad was attracted to his wife. Zayd divorces her. Muhammad says don't because he's worried about what people are going to say. And then uh, Allah reveals that Muhammad is supposed to marry this woman whose divorce was caused by Muhammad in the first place. Muhammad's wife Hafsa once caught him in bed with another, caught him in her bed with another woman, his slave girl, Mary the Cop. Uh, he, didn't, he wanted to avoid conflict, so he promised that he would stop having sex with Mary. Uh, but later he received a revelation telling him not to. So he takes a vow that he's not going to have sex with this slave girl anymore. He makes a vow, he promises Hafsa and Aisha that he's not going to do this anymore. And then a revelation of the Quran comes, chapter 66, verses 1 through 2. O Prophet, why do you forbid yourself that which Allah hath made lawful for you? You seek to please your wives, and Allah is forgiving, merciful. Allah indeed has sanctioned for you the expiation of your oaths, and Allah is your protector, and he is the knowing wise. So Muhammad receives the revelation, and the revelation tells him it's okay to break his oath to his wives about, having, about not having sex anymore with his slave girl. Now at this point, it just becomes very difficult to accept what Muhammad is saying about someone who came six centuries earlier. I might believe Muhammad if he's talking about what ha what's happening during his time or something like that, but when he's talking about six centuries earlier, it becomes very difficult to take him seriously as getting revelations from God. But it gets worse. Muhammad eventually had doubts about his revelations, and he was told that if he has doubts about his revelations, because remember, I mean, at first he thinks he's uh, he's possessed by a poetry spirit, and then he gets, you know, he delivers the satanic verses and so on. But he's told if he has doubts about his revelations, he's supposed to go to the people of the book. And he's told that he can confirm his revelations by going to the people of the book. Uh, chapter 10, verse 94, Allah says to Muhammad, but if you, Muhammad, are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. So Muhammad is supposed to go to the people of the book to confirm his message, but these are the revelations that are supposedly corrupted, and revelations which we know say that Jesus is the divine Son of God who died on the cross and rose from the dead. So if this is where, where uh, Muhammad is supposed to go to confirm his message, it's not going to confirm his message. Now, Shabir has argued that Muhammad is mentioned in, uh, in the, the book of John, chapter 14, and I would just like to thank Shabir for really uh, helping me in all these debates by proving that Jesus is God. Why do I say that? Well, in the same passage, in the very same passage of, of Jesus' presentation here, he says in chapter 16, verse 7, same, same speech by Jesus, 
But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So here's Jesus saying that he's the one who sends the helper or the comforter. Now, in Christian theology, that would be the spirit that he's sending because that's what the text says. But if Shabir wants to say that this is referring to Muhammad, then notice Jesus goes away and Jesus is the one who sends Muhammad. Now, according to Islam, according to Islam, who sent Muhammad? Allah, right? So, so Muhammad is sent by Allah. But Jesus says that the comforter is sent by him. Jesus sends the comforter. So if the comforter is sent by Jesus and Muhammad is sent by Allah, then if the comforter is Muhammad, that would make Jesus Allah. Jesus says he's the one who sends the comforter. If that's Muhammad, then Jesus is the one who sends Muhammad. And that would mean that Jesus is Muhammad's God. If Shabir wants to go that route, that's fine with me. Go right ahead, Shabir. Uh, uh, folks, uh, David said that uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was directed to ask the people of the book in case he should have any doubt. Uh, but that revelation to him in Surah 10, verse 94, is even more specific than that. Uh, it, the point seems to be that uh, uh, people were saying to Muhammad, well, God wouldn't send a human being. If he's going to send somebody as a messenger, that should be an angel. And God is saying to Muhammad, if you have any doubts about this, ask the people of the book. They will confirm that what they know from the history of Revelation is that there were human beings, prophets of the Old Testament, and you are similar to those... Uh, uh, prophets. Not that the people of the book will accept that, but, but you will know from your discussion with them. The Quran is not saying to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, take every single thing in the Christian Bible to be the 100% gospel truth. And I think this is where uh, people need to draw that distinction. Our Christian friends are taking this verse to mean that Muslims are supposed to depend uh, on the Bible and, and, and regard it to be true. Uh, now, uh, John, uh, John chapter 14, where the Paracletus is mentioned, I find David uh, caricaturing my statements and then he uh, uh, rebuts the caricature. Uh, that, that's known in, in the logic as the straw man fallacy in argument, where you rebut the th not the thing that the person actually said, but some uh, caricature of it, which is easier to knock down. Notice that when I refer to John chapter 14, I did not refer to that statement as though this is the actual statement of Jesus. In fact, I went to great pains to show that as it is, this is not the actual statement of Jesus. It is true that I said nothing about the part where Jesus said he will send uh, the paraclete. Now David picks up upon that, but my whole approach has been to not take this as the absolute truth the way Jesus said it. I said that these are statements that developed over time. Uh, they were transmitted from one person to another, and uh, naturally they developed lives of their own. The one saying of Jesus became five different statements, uh, two in John 14, uh, one in John 15, and two in John 16. And we're trying to reconstruct what was the original statement. Yes, in the later statements of Jesus, we have it that Jesus is clear, claiming many lofty things for himself. But as James D.G. Dunn has shown, uh, that, that, that's what the later Gospels did, especially the Gospel according to John, uh, saying more about the status of Jesus. So whereas in the previous Gospels, Jesus was preaching something about the kingdom of God, here in the Gospel according to John, he is more preaching about himself, how great he is. So we have to make some uh, adjustment uh, for that. So no, I, I wouldn't accept the statement as it is, as the statement of Jesus, and, and then conclude as David was trying to lead uh, to say, well, that means that Jesus is, is God and so on. Now, in one of, a, lot of, a lot of what David has just said, he is actually depending not on the Quran alone, but on stories that circulated among Muslims, and they were collected in Muslim sources. They are otherwise respected sources among Muslims. They are main books of, Christian, of, of Muslim uh, um, beliefs and uh, uh, history and commentary on the Quran. But that doesn't mean that all of that information is correct. So for example, when it says that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, thought that he was possessed and thought that he was going to, uh, uh, he should commit suicide. All of these are stories in other books apart from the Quran itself. So one, he has to say that all of these, this information is absolutely correct and this proves uh, something. But even if we take it that uh, one of the Old Testament prophets uh, responded with fear and uh, misapprehension and uh, confusion when he is visited by a, a theophany, when he sees a, 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 a sort of appearance from God or an angel, well, that's very normal. If it happened to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that doesn't disprove the nature of his revelation. In fact, it proves uh, the contrary, that he is trying to be careful not to become an agent for the devil. He wants to make sure uh, that he's actually getting a revelation from God. 
God. The story of the satanic verses has been disputed. Some scholars said that it is authentic, that it really happened like that, and some scholars said no. So we cannot use a disputed story like that to disprove the entire uh, career of the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace. We have other good evidence to show that in fact he is uh, a true prophet of God. John Burton has actually, as an independent non-Muslim scholar, has discounted that story and shown how it could have actually developed among Muslims. It's a long explanation, uh, no time to give the details, but I can if necessary. Uh, the, similarly, the idea idea that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was uh, under a magic spell. That too is mentioned in some hadiths, but it does not mean that it actually happened in history. Many Muslims think that this actually did not, uh, uh, in fact, happen. And even if it did happen, does the Bible uh, say that magic is impossible? So is David as a Christian saying that magic is impossible, it couldn't have happened? And if somebody uh, happens to be under a magic spell for a period and then he comes out as this story is saying about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, obviously during that period of the magic spell, we wouldn't rely on anything he said or did and hold him accountable. But what about the rest of his life? Are you going to discount a man just because he happened to be on a magic spell uh, or, or for, for a few days? Or, or even for a longer period than that. What about the Quranic uh, limitation of four wives in Surah 4? Uh, I don't take that to be a Quranic limitation. The Quran mentions marry in, in twos and threes and fours, but it doesn't say anything about five or six or seven. It doesn't say that there is an actual limit. Uh, it's common among Muslim scholars to hold that four is the limit. And then when they go to explain the Surah 33 verse, they say that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a special permission. But what I see in the Surah 33 verse is that the special permission for the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that he could marry without giving a, a, a dower. Whereas other Muslims were required, as a matter of fact, to give a dower. Why was the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, exempted from this? Because he had actually uh, vowed uh, and, and dedicated himself to a life of poverty. It's almost like somebody in one of our modern countries, if, if he has taken a vow of poverty, then he would not pay any taxes. So in this case, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, wouldn't have anything to give in some circumstances. That shouldn't prevent him from being able to marry. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, married for many political and social reasons. Just as the kings and queens of other countries marry each other and the cement alliances, the Prophet, peace be upon him, married many women uh, for this purpose, and he needed to have that uh, avenue open to him. As for the story about Zayed, that too comes from Ibn Ishaq. It's one of the uh, books, uh, an early biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but it was written uh, a hundred years after the Prophet, peace be upon him, and even now survives in a redaction later than that. So we cannot say that everything in that uh, biography is uh, absolutely true. So too with the story of Hassan and, and the slave girl, the interpretation uh, that David referred to is only one, and that is mentioned in Ibn Sa'd, uh, uh, Ibn Sa'd's book, but there are other interpretations that are mentioned in other sources. For example, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was eating a, a foul-smelling uh, honey, or, or at least that some of the wives didn't like, and he pledged to be uh, a, a loof from that, and God is saying, why do you make yourself aloof from something that God has basically made permissible for you? Whatever the interpretation, it shows that uh, there are different ways of looking at this, and David is looking at it only one way, and, uh, and, and being critical of Islam on that basis. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Shabir. We're going to reset the clock for seven minutes, and we're going to give David a chance to rebut on that, and we're ready to go right now. Uh, thank you, Shabir. Now, uh, first, Shabir talks about... <laughs> Muhammad in John chapter 14, and he says that I'm caricaturing his uh, arguments. Uh, what he's really saying is that these statements developed over time, but just think about the methodology here, ladies and gentlemen. This is a book that begins by saying, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, that the Word created everything, in verse 3, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is uh, John chapter 1. The Word, is Je and the word become, enters creation, becomes Jesus of Nazareth. Um, he, Jesus is identified as the Son of God and as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, right there in John chapter 1. Later in the book, Jesus says that he's the one who will judge the world, that he's the one who raises the dead, that the dead will hear his voice and rise. And so these are the things you find in that we get to, to chapter 14 specifically. This is where Jesus calls himself the way and the truth and the life. Says no one comes to the Father except through him. Jesus tells his followers that whatever they ask in his name, he will do it. So he can answer prayers right there in John 14. And then we get to the, uh, the passage in question. I will ask the Father, notice, Father. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. So notice Jesus is talking to his apostles here. He says to his apostles, he's going to ask the Father and the Father will give them another 
helper. So he's talking to the apostles. You talk, this is Muhammad here? This is Muhammad? And so he's going to be with them forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you. So the spirit abides with them, with his followers, and will be in you. So Muhammad abides with the followers of Jesus, and he's going to be, uh, he's going to be in them. Now, this is so absurd to say that this is talking about Muhammad. And, and Shabir says, well, he's not saying that all of this was actually said by Jesus. But it, again, you, you have the Father sending him, but Jesus says he's also sending him. So it's Father and Son who together send the Spirit, who if you look at the attributes of the Spirit, is divine. So you have Trinity here in the middle of a book it, that repeatedly declares the deity of Christ, and we're going to take that out and say, this is Muhammad, and anything that disagrees with that must have been corrupted over time. If that's the method, you could defend anything like that. I could say that's Shabir in this verse and defend it. Anything that says it's not Shabir must be a corruption. You could defend anything like this. And this is one of the main two arguments that Shabir gave us for, uh, for uh, Muhammad's spiritual reliability. Um, Shabir points out that I don't just depend on the Quran, I, I depend on other sources for my history of Muhammad. Well, I, I really don't have any other place to go other than other Islamic sources. The Quran is not a history book of Muhammad. Uh, we, have to go to, we have to go to other sources. He said that Muhammad's possession and suicide attempts are based on other sources. Yes, but as Shabir knows, historians rely on what's called the principle of embarrassment. In other words, when they're taking these sources, they don't take everything as equally reliable. They, they, they apply certain historical principles. One of those is the principle of embarrassment. This is true in Christianity. This is true in uh, Islamic sources. And the, the idea is if people are going to make something up, they're probably going to make up something that helps their case, not embarrasses them somehow. And so the principle of embarrassment would say if you find embarrassing material, probably wasn't made up, right? If it's your enemies making up embarrassing material, that would be one thing. But if it's your followers who are, who are saying something embarrassing, it's probably true. Again, in, in Christianity, in Christian sources or in Muslim sources. Um, so, when we read about Muhammad thinking that he's possessed or uh, thinking that, uh, or trying to kill himself, um, yes, we would be going to these sources, but these don't seem to be like the, the sorts of things that Muslims would invent, and so I would treat them as pretty reliable. Um, the Satanic Verses story, uh, Shabir says, is disputed, yes, but I have 37 Muslim sources of varying degrees of how old they are and uh, giving variations of the story. But uh, that's a lot of sources, and applying the, cr the principle of embarrassment to that, uh, we'd have to say that's not the sort of thing Muslims are going to make up. You're not going to be a Muslim one day and say, hey, I'm going to make up a story about Muhammad delivering revelations from the devil and not being able to tell the difference. The only explanation for this in the Muslim sources is that it's authentic. Uh, as for the magic spell, Shabir says it may not have happened, um, but am I saying that this automatically means that Muhammad can't be a prophet, can't be speaking the truth. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that about uh, Muhammad thinking he was possessed by some sort of poetry spirit or that, he was, uh, that he's a false prophet because uh, he tried to kill himself or that he's a false prophet because of the satanic verses or that he's a false prophet uh, because of the magic spell. I'm not saying he's a false prophet because of any of those. I'm saying if I'm trying to determine his reliability, his spiritual reliability, these are all factors that I have to take into consideration. I have to look at all of this and say, uh, uh, let me put this on the scales. Uh, is this guy reliable? Now, Shabir says that chapter 4, verse 3 of the Quran isn't a limitation on the number of wives. Um, if that's his position, I'm, I'm fine with that because my, my point was, he was Muhammad was changing his rules, so I can't say that on that, on that account if Shabir is saying that this uh, is not a Quranic limitation, so I will, uh, I will submit that point. Um, he said that the story of Zayd um, and uh, Zainab is based on late source. It's based on the Quran. It's right there in chapter 33, verse 37. Uh, so you, you have the story expanded in other sources, but that, that actual story is chapter 33, verse 37. And Shabir said that Hafsa and the, slave, and the, st the story of Hafsa and Aisha and the slave girl Mary the Copt is uh, only one of the, the various uh, cr explanations of chapter 66, verses 1 through 2 of the Quran. That's true, but uh, here I would apply the principle of embarrassment. If you have another story uh, about Muhammad eating honey or something like that, and then you have a more embarrassing story about Muhammad making an oath to his wives, I promise I will not have sex with this girl anymore, and then getting a revelation, the principle of embarrassment would say the one that's, that, that would kind of be more embarrassing is probably the one that wasn't invented. And if there's another story, and by, by the way, there's no, there's no, there's no impossibility of the 
of the Quranic revelation relating to both stories. But if we had to pick one, if we think only one can be true, you would generally go with the one that probably wouldn't be invented. The other one would probably be a, a watered-down alternative to explain away the meaning of this verse that wouldn't be as embarrassing. So do we have any reason to trust Muhammad on an intellectual level? No. Do we have any uh, reason to trust him on a spiritual level? I would say no. So do we have any reason to trust him on what he says about Jesus? I say absolutely not. Thank you, David. Okay, we're going to reset the clock for five minutes to give Shabir Ali a chance to re uh, rebut those comments. And the clock is ready now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as for John chapter uh, 14, uh, again, I'm, I'm not taking the statements as they are in the Gospel according to John. Uh, uh, David has given a long list of things that the J Gospel according to John says that Muslims will not accept. Uh, in fact, I want to pause here and say, I ask Christians, why do they accept even these things that are said in the Gospel according to John? Yeah, I agree that there's a lot in the Gospel according to John that neither Muslims nor Christians should accept. Take, for example, John saying that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Where did John get this from? Did Jesus ever say, I am the Word of God? Did he say these words anywhere in the, in the Bible? Even in John's Gospel, Jesus doesn't say it. John is saying this about Jesus. So now, how does John know this? if Jesus didn't actually say it. Now, go back to the Old Testament. If the Word of God was there with God from the very beginning, how come Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 starts with God being there and it's only God's Spirit that is hovering over the waters of the deep? So there's God and God's Spirit. Where, where is the Word of God here? Uh, it, it, we know of a uh, mention of the wisdom of God in, in Proverbs, but wisdom of God is a female, well, because, well, in any case, it's depicted as a female, and uh, and she says, Yahweh created me. So, so where was the word of God in, in the Old Testament? John has actually invented this, and, and this is not something we should accept. James D.G. Dunn uh, says that many of these things which uh, uh, David just quoted, that John's gospel is saying Jesus is the Lamb of God and so on, uh, that uh, we should ask, uh, what about the I am sayings in particular? If Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, if Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, and all of these I am sayings, before Abraham was, I am, and so on, why are these statements lacking in the other Gospels? Why are they picked up only in the Gospel according to John? Uh, the, the, the obvious reason for this, according to James Dunn, is that these state statements developed later. They were not picked up by the earlier Gospels. They were not thought to be authentic. They later developed and came to be in the Gospel according to John. It's a later depiction of Jesus. Now this illustrates that when the Quran is calling Christians back to monotheism and saying that Jesus is, is a servant and messenger of God, it's actually calling Jesus, Christians back to the original uh, Jesus. Now back to John chapter 14 and uh, this paraclete saying. What I'm saying is that uh, we're not picking and choosing in the gospel according to John. We are being cautious about what we accept from the gospel according to John. Here we have five statements represented from Jesus. It's basically the same statement represented five ways in three chapters of John's Gospel. We want to know what was the original statement. And we have five. We have to comb them back and see, like if two essays are similar, we want to see what was the original one. Did one copy from the other or, what, or did both copy from the same, same source? When uh, traditions are transmitted like this, we want to know what is the original tradition. So this may, be, may have been closer. In John chapter 16, verse number uh, th uh, 13, it says, but when he comes, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to all truth. He will not speak of his own, but he will speak what he hears and will declare to you the things that are coming. This looks like a definition of a prophet, similar to the de de description in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse number 18, where Moses speaks about another prophet to come after him. He will do the same thing. In fact, uh, Raymond Brown, in his two-volume commentary on John's Gospel, went at great lengths to show the difficulties that are there in these statements if you try to apply them to the Holy Spirit. For example, that he will convict the world. When did the Holy Spirit ever do that? And so... Many scholars, uh, even though Raymond Brown does not agree with this final conclusion, uh, many scholars that he has cited say that uh, this actually refers to a human being, a prophet to come after Jesus. It was not originally about the Holy Spirit, but that saying got transformed over time to make it appear that Jesus was speaking about the Holy Spirit. Raymond Brown says that when Jesus were, apparently was not coming back and the expectation that he should come back within the lifetime of the disciples failed, One minute. Uh, that is when 
then John took the paraclete statement and made it refer to the Holy Spirit like this uh, to say that Jesus somehow is that Holy Spirit coming back. And that uh, gives you another theological problem because it means that Jesus is the Holy Spirit, whereas in classical Trin Trinitarian doctrine, Jesus is not the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is not Jesus and neither is the Father. Uh, and so we have problem upon problem. The solution for all of this is to recognize that Jesus was speaking about another prophet to come after him. That prophet is the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The criterion of embarrassment it's not a foolproof criterion, even in Christianity. Scholars discuss this. There might have been reasons why Muslims invented the story of Zainab, maybe to prove the, uh, the, uh, uh, the potency of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, for their own personal purposes later on, to justify their own uh, behavior. Uh, even the satanic verses, according to John Burton, there is a very good reason why Muslims would have invented this as an explanation for some passages of, of the Quran. So altogether, we have that there is nothing really in what David has, David has said. Okay, we're going to reset the clock for David. David has five minutes to have his second rebuttal before we get into our next section. So the clock is just about ready, and we'll let you take it away right now. I will wait until it reaches okay. five. Thank you. There we go. Uh, Shabir launched an attack on the Gospel of John. Now, who quoted the Gospel of John to defend his prophet? That, that, that was Shabir. Uh, our topic tonight isn't the reliability of the Gospel of John. Uh, Shabir quoted the Gospel of John, picked a verse right from the middle of it, uh, and said that this verse, where, which is identical, where Jesus says that the Comforter is coming and identifies him as the Spirit, that this is talking about Muhammad. And I pointed out what would be just the obvious absurdity. This is a book which claims over and over again that Jesus is God, that Jesus is dying on the cross for sins, and that he's going to rise from the dead. So going to the middle of a book like this and saying, uh, yeah, we're going to pick something out of this. And it's just, I mean, it, it boggles the mind. Using this method, you could say that verse means anything whatsoever. Shabir says, ah, well, we have five different versions. Show me, show me a version of the Gospel of John that doesn't begin by calling Jesus the Word of God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It says uh, a verse that doesn't say that the Word was God. Shabir says, well, you know, what, where is he getting this from? Well, I... I we don't know what Jesus said to John during his lifetime, but John is obviously applying uh, the various statements in the Old Testament, which talks about God creating through the word. Uh, for instance, Psalm 33, verse 6, uh, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. So John is applying these. You can say, you can say it's wrong. You can say John doesn't know what he's doing. That has nothing, that has nothing to do with this. If you're saying that John doesn't know what he's talking about, he's making this up as he goes along, why are you quoting John 14? Why are you quoting this man who's making things up as he goes along and has no clue what he's talking about? Well, because he includes this little part that if we throw out everything, he said, everything else he says in the area and we throw out the rest of the book, we can defend Muhammad. Again, I could defend Shabir like this. I could defend Chris like this. Um, so uh, which... Uh, Shabir, now, Shabir tied this in. He quoted uh, John chapter 16, verse 13, says that this, this is, sounds like it's describing a prophet. So notice, he quoted chapter 14 and chapter 16, picked a verse out of each and said, yes, this shows that this is talking about a prophet, and then ignored all the rest of the text where this person is sent by Jesus and where he has all these kind of attributes that apply to God. And then that's the method. Uh, and again, this is, this is the main proof that he's a prophet. But Shabir, interestingly, said that this is the prophet similar to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Uh, this will tie into the uh, satanic verses story. Because let me go ahead and read chapter 18, in its, uh, chapter 18, verse 18, in this context. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen. So this is God. I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. It shall come about that whoever will not listen to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. So, he gives two criteria of a false prophet right there in the passage that Shabir quoted. Shabir appealed to Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. Right there in Deuteronomy 18.20, just two verses later, we have two criteria of a false prophet. If he speaks a word that God didn't tell him to speak, and if he speaks in the names of other gods. Why is this relevant? Well, according to early, our earliest Muslim sources, Muhammad 
delivered a revelation saying that you can pray to Allah, Alusa, and Manat, three goddesses, and he later comes back and says, that didn't actually come from God, that came from somewhere else. So, here's the point. Shabir, over these uh, past two days, has shown a lot of concern for the Old Testament and being in line with the Old Testament. I haven't talked about that too much because I reject the methodology. If the guy who rises from the dead tells me what to believe about God, I'm going with the guy who rose from the dead. But Shabir has appealed over and over again to the Old Testament, to the Torah. If we do that, Moses says, the prophet who does these two things has to die. And what this means is, if Muhammad had delivered the satanic verses, which he does, according to Muslim sources, and it's not the sort of thing Muslims would invent, if Muhammad had done that during the time of Moses, Moses would have told the people to pick up stones and stone him to death as a false prophet. Fortunately for Muhammad, he wasn't in the time of Moses. He was among pagans where he could get away with that. But if we're talking about whether Muhammad is in line with the Torah and the Torah says he would have been, he would have been killed, probably not someone we can trust to talk about Jesus. Okay, thank you, David. We're going to reset the clock for 6 o'clock. We, 6 o'clock, 6 minutes. Make it 6 minutes, sorry. I know you're listening out there. That's good. So we'll, this is a crossfire section where we'll give people, our debaters here, each uh, one minute at a, at a time, and we'll do three rounds of that. And we have the clock set at 6 o'clock, so or 6 minutes. Here I go again. Uh, David, I'm sorry. It would be uh, um, Shabir. We want to have you, because David went last. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, David, I'm glad you referred to Deuteronomy chapter 18, because the criteria for a, far, for, for a false prophet would seem to disprove both Jesus and Paul. Because uh, one of the criteria, criteria is that if the prophet says something will happen, and then that thing does not happen, then that was a false prophet. Now, uh, Paul, in uh, his letter to the Thessalonians, uh, spoke as though he will be alive at the time when Jesus returns. That did not happen. So that's a false prediction. And I just mentioned that according to Raymond Brown, Jesus uh, um, was expected to return within the lifetime of his disciples, and he did not. In fact, many scholars think that Jesus failed on this account. E.P. Sanders, in his book, The Historical Figure of Jesus, says that Jesus failed in this. So the gospel is having predicting his return within the lifetime of his disciples, and he did not return. So that means, according to the Bible itself, Jesus would be a false prophet. The only thing that rescues Jesus from being a false prophet is Muslim belief in him from, for Muslims from the Quran itself. Then we can believe that he's a true prophet. David. Well, uh, Christians don't believe that Jesus was speaking in the names of some other gods. If, you, if you're reading these passages in a manner that's consistent with the Old Testament, there in the, I mean, the opening chapters of Genesis, God comes down and walks among the people. Uh, later in the Torah, God can lead people. God can lead people as a, as a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire. So the God of the Old Testament has no problem entering creation. So you can't use that as a criterion for saying, well, you know, Jesus saying that he is God entering creation, that would be another God and therefore uh, Christianity is false. Uh, but, I mean, there's, there's a problem here. We're talking about why, whether we can trust Muhammad in this debate. We're talking about whether we can trust what Muhammad says about Jesus. So, if this is a verse and a passage you quoted, and that verse says that someone who Ten does seconds. the things that Muhammad did is a false prophet who would have to die, we have to reject him as a prophet, and we can only conclude that we shouldn't believe what he says about Jesus. Shabir. Uh, of course, that uh, goes back to what I said before, David, you are relying on one particular story which may have been invented. According to John Burton, there's a perfectly good reason why Muslims would have invented that story. So why would you just simply go by the, uh, the, the one version that uh, would be critical of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, without seeing the entire uh, um, set of proofs for the Prophet Muhammad as a prophet of God. What if, for example, about the Quran uh, being the word of God as I demonstrated that it has these numerical patterns in it, uh, things multiplying uh, to a perfect uh, multiples of seven and the perfect number 28, which according to mathematicians is a concept. So how does that get into the Quran if the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not uh, being inspired by God? This would actually answer all of your things about intellectual uh, and, uh, and spiritual seconds. Uh, reasons for believing in a prophet because now we have here the obvious signs that the, the hand of God is in this book. David. 
All right, well, you, 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 you asked why I would believe this story when there are perfectly good reasons to make this up, but you, you've only cited John Burton, and John Burton believes that uh, pretty much all, all of Islamic history was invented as explanations for the Quran, and I don't take that seriously. I have a little bit more confidence than he does in the uh, ability of Muslims to do history. As far as the good reason, there's no good reason. I mean, you can apply that and say, you know, in order to explain Surah, uh, Surah 22, verse 52, that, you know, they needed some background. You could invent all kinds of stories. You could invent all kinds of stories. The idea that Muslims, in order to explain a verse of the Quran, would say, yeah, Muhammad had to deliver a revelation from the devil in, in praising uh, three goddesses and saying we can pray to them and then he has to come back and say uh, the devil tricked me into doing that it's Ten just seconds. false God I mean you don't need that as an explanation so just the fact that it's in so many Muslim sources points to an authentic original Shabir? now if you want to apply the criteria and be fair to both sides now you're saying that it's uh, it's fine for God to come down in in human form uh, but uh, the, the point is that uh, in, in, in the Old Testament, God made it very clear. If somebody comes to you, you don't know him to be God, and he says to you, I am God, well, then you should stone him to death. And this explains why the Jews are saying we have a law, and the law says that we must stone this man because he's claiming to be God. So it, that would mean that God actually set up the Jews to stone his son or to stone himself if Jesus is actually God. And that would be absurd. And in fact, it would point, you're saying if they lived in the time of Moses, they would be stoned. Well, this is exactly what was going to happen to Jesus, what the Jews wanted to do to him. And they, they couldn't stone him according to the New Testament. They didn't have the authority, so they tried crucifixion instead, uh, bending the hand of the Roman uh, uh, procurator. So in that case, the New Testament actually uh, put together with the old shows that Jesus was a false prophet when we tie that in with Deuteronomy. David, last minute. Well, uh, according to Shabir, according, then uh, based on the Old Testament that Jesus was a false prophet, I mean, do you, hear, do you hear what Muslims say? I mean, this is a criterion laid down by Moses. Shabir is saying this would make Jesus a false prophet. Well, no, it wouldn't under any circumstances. Jesus is not claiming to be a separate God. He specifically refutes that interpretation in John chapter 5, where he explains that he can do nothing apart from the Father. So Jesus specifically condemns the interpretation, which they could get because of the radical claims he was making. They started thinking that he's claiming to be an alternative God. And Jesus, Jesus rebukes that interpretation. And so you can't interpret Jesus as claiming to be some other God. He doesn't allow that interpretation. And so this doesn't apply to Jesus, but it does apply to Muhammad, who's delivering teachings according to Muslim sources, not according to Jewish or Christian sources. Muslim sources say he delivered these verses, and that was a death penalty under Moses. And go right ahead. All right. Uh, Shabir is, has, a, has brought attention to the mathematical patterns in the Quran. I'm typing into Google mathematical patterns in the Bible and seeing what pops up. I'm going to go ahead and click on this one that says the astonishing pattern of sevens in the Bible since uh, Shabir appealed to the astonishing pattern of sevens. I don't know how reliable this is, but this is just what pops up to show you how easy this is. Um, so this is Genesis, the first verse of Genesis, the very first verse of Genesis. And here's the list. The number of Hebrew words in Genesis 1, 1, 7. The number of letters equals 28, which is 7 times 4. The first three Hebrew words translated, in the beginning God created, have 14 letters. That's 7 times 2. The last four Hebrew words, the heavens and the earth, have 14 letters. That's 7 times 2. The fourth and fifth words have 7 letters. The sixth and seventh words have le 7 letters. The three key words, God, heaven, and earth, have 14 letters. That's 7 times 2. The number of letters in the four remaining words is also 14. That's 7 times 2. The shortest word in the verse is the middle word with 7 letters. The Hebrew numeric value of the first, middle, and last letters is 133, which is 7 times 19. There we have the number 19. The Hebrew numeric value of the first and last letters of all seven words is 1,393, which is seven times 199. But that's, the, that's uh, Genesis 1.1. What about the book of Matthew? In the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, we have the history of Christ's birth, and he goes on with the same thing. The number of words in the seven-word passage is 161, which is seven times 23. The number of vocabulary words is 77, which is seven times 11. It just goes on and on. So is this good evidence? 
I don't see how it is, and maybe you could have it as some sort of supplementary evidence if One you didn't minute. have a lot of problems, but in Islam, you don't have that. What do you have in Islam? We asked whether Muhammad can be an intellectually reliable source of information about Jesus, but he passes on false stories and obviously can't tell the difference between a true story and a false story. We can't trust him as someone who's, uh, an, who's intellectually reliable to do history. And then, so we, the only thing we can do is ask ourselves if he's getting uh, revelations from God, we find he can't perform miracles, um, he thinks he's possessed, he tries to commit suicide, he delivers revelations that he acknowledges are from the devil, and he thinks that, um, uh, he thinks that he's the victim of black magic. And you go and, and he's constantly receiving revelations that have no purpose other than satisfying his desires. The question is, what evidence do we have to outweigh all of this? According to Shabir, well, you can rip something out of context in John, and that proves it, or you can go with these numerical patterns, and that proves it. Either way, we have no reason to trust Muhammad. Thank you, David. And we're going to reset the clock for three o'clock or three minutes for <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Shabir, and we're getting there, and take it away right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, folks, as we come to the end, I, actually David has uh, shocked me by his approach to, to investigation. We don't investigate a matter by doing a quick uh, Google search and then right away reading off uh, what we find there as though this actually is worth something. Uh, to do a proper search, if David has, has not heard what I presented before about the, the occurrence of the number seven in the Quran and multiples thereof, uh, then uh, he should say, okay, I don't know about that, but let me go and research it. And maybe in another debate, we'll come back to that question or maybe in a follow-up writing. But you don't just Google and then rattle off whatever you read there because as you know, on the web, you have good and bad stuff. What he has just looked into, and actually I've looked into this uh, in, in some detail, uh, appears to me to be the work of Ivan Panin, who wrote a long time ago, but Christians have not followed up with his work, and they've actually refuted it, and they found that these patterns do not exist, that sometimes he fudged his data, he was very selective, and he even tried to rewrite his own Greek New Testament in order to make the numbers agree. So, you know, if the numbers were supposed to come out of the book, but now you have to rewrite the book to make the numbers agree, then your, your methodology is faulty. We're talking now about the method applied by uh, a uh, Abdudaim uh, Al Kahil. His website is kahil7.com. You go to the website, download a 274 page PDF document, study that document, and then refute it, and then we'll talk. Uh, but uh, don't go Google search as though, you know, uh, that's not befitting of a scholar anyway. And we are here as two scholars. We have doctor titles. We have an academic responsibility to approach things properly. Uh, David's point is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not intellectual because he uh, reported fables of the ancients. Uh, Sidney Griffith in his book, The Bible in Arabic, actually uh, replies to that. And he shows that uh, the Bible has a very high quotient of biblical knowledge. What the Quran, uh, sorry, the Quran has a very high quotient of biblical knowledge. But what the Quran does do is that the Quran draws attention to what people already know and brings forward a moral lesson from that. The Quran is not there to teach people history, One but minute. to teach them how to think of that history and what theology should actually be based on that history. So the Quran is calling people back to one God with all of these uh, stories. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, the, the paraclete saying, I did not selectively just pick the one thing I like out of the gospel according to John. Uh, uh, my general approach to the gospel according to John is that we must comb what was uh, comb the gospel to find out those snippets of information which actually go back to the authentic Jesus. It looks to me like this paraclete saying is an authentic saying uh, of Jesus when it refers to a human being, another prophet to come after Jesus. And that is a painstaking uh, re uh, effort that leads to that uh, uh, result of comparing and contrasting and trying to reconstruct. So finally, it's very clear that the Quran is bringing Christians back to believing in Jesus as a prophet of God who did not die for the sins of the world. And if you want your sins to be forgiven, you ask God for your forgiveness. Paul hijacked Christianity and Muhammad, peace be upon him, brings Christianity back to Jesus. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you both for participating in both these one-hour debates.